are sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences and the English Department. Um, this is our first reading this semester from that series. And um, I'm, I'm going to remind you to turn your cell phones off or on silent. And, um, and that's it. OK, so our guest is Sabrina Orag-Mark. She grew up in Brooklyn, New York. She earned a BA from Barnard College, Columbia University, an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and a PhD in English from the University of Georgia. She is the author of the book length poetry collection, The Babies, winner of the Saturnalia Book Prize chosen by Jen Miller, and Sim Sum, as well as the chapbook, chapbook Water Bee's Extraordinary Cousin Arise for a Visit and Other Tales from Woodland Editions. Dorothy, a publishing project, released her collection of short of, of stories, Wild Milk, in 2018. And that's the book that we have for uh, our students. Um, Marx writes a, a monthly column, Happy, for the Paris Review, in which she focuses on fairy tales and motherhood. Her awards include a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Sustainable Arts Foundation Award, and a fellowship from the Fine Arts Work Center in Princeton, Massachusetts. She lives in Athens, Georgia with her husband, Reginald McKnight, and their two sons. But I uh, thought I would excerpt, give, you know, read a couple of excerpts from reviews from this book, um, uh, Wild Milk. So from the Kirkus Review, which gave her book a start review, the stories drift in the way of the best fairy tales, released from dependence on narrative sensibility to become both more odd and more true than any mere fiction. Stories in which laughter is sometimes the only response to sorrow. Beauty is strange, and love is fierce and unending, a necessary book for our perilous age. And then another one from Oprah.com, uh, which is written by Don Raffle. <clears throat> this aptly titled short story collection is indeed a wild treat. Enfolding love and fear, paranoia and desire, these deliriously irrational stories manage to make perfect sense. So let's um, welcome uh, Sabrina. Thank you. This is cozy. <laughs> I like cozy. Um, so I'm going to read three stories from Miles Milk. Um, they're all pretty short. Um, and in many ways, I, I started off as a poet. Um, and I still very much like inhabit the poet body. Um, but what had happened is um, my first two collections are prose poems. Um, and as I started writing these stories, they started off almost as prose poems, like these little boxes. Um, and they sort of, they started to grow um, and become more and more unwieldy. Um, and so, and they started taking the shape of stories. So um, I often like to describe um, a lot of the stories in this um, collection as um, a, you know prose poems that kind of have burst out of their clothing, uh, so to speak, um, um, and um, a poem that has has started to tear um, and starts to show um, its um, um, its body as belonging to the body of, of a story. Um, so 
The first, I'll, I'll read the title story first. Um, it's called Wild Milk. Um, and it was actually the, the, the idea behind it, um, I think, I, I'm not sure, I think it was three years ago or four years ago when there was an ice storm um, in Atlanta and um, a friend of mine lives in Birmingham and they got the same weather um, and the highways became these ice skating rinks and buses were, school buses filled with children were stranded on the, um, on the highway and a very good friend of mine um, couldn't get to her one-year-old in a daycare center. Um, and so this to me, um, I, I couldn't stop thinking about, you know, the, the, um, this inability to get, to get to your child, to get to your child and to keep trying um, to get to your child and being unable to get to your child. And that's where the story um, begins. So it's called Wild Milk. On the first day of Live Oak Daycare, all the children are given shovels and a small bag of dirt. We encourage the children, even the babies, especially the babies, to work hard imaginatively. Miss Birdie, my son's teacher, winks. She sits my baby boy in the middle of the floor with his shovel and dirt. He is not even a year old. I look around. The babies are happy. I have never seen such happy babies chewing on their shovels, spreading around their dirt. Miss Birdie gives me a hug. I wave goodbye to my boy, but he doesn't see me. Go, go, says Miss Birdie. He's in good hands. She shows me her hands. They remind me, for some reason, of my hands. Three hours later, I come to pick up my boy. He is wearing a bright orange poncho that does not belong to him. He crawls toward me like a searchlight. Your child, says Miss Birdie, is a phenomenon. I blush, oh, thank you. We too think he is very special, I say. I want to ask about the poncho, but Miss Birdie goes on. I mean, your child is a phenomenon says Miss Birdie. What I mean to say is that your child is a real man. Miss Birdie softly pinches her tongue and pulls off a long white hair. Oh, that's better, she says. I mean a ma. She makes little tiny spits. I mean a no one. Your child, says Miss Birdie, is a real no one. No, no, that's not it either. Miss Birdie smooths her stiff cotton skirt. It's pink with tiny red cherries on it. What I mean to say, most of all, says Miss Birdie, is that I love not being dead. Me too, I say. Oh, good, says Miss Birdie. Here's his bottle. He drank all his milk and then cried and cried and cried for more. In the hallway, I pass a mother covered in daughters. I count five. I hold up my bundled son like a form of identification, like he will provide me safe passage across the border. No daughters, she asks. No, I say, no daughters. How come, she asks. She seems to be blaming me unfairly. By the time they arrived, I explain, the daughters had turned. Rotten? She asks, not exactly rotten, but gigantic. I hand her my boy so I can spread my arms wide to show her how big. I take my boy back, gigantic, I repeat, and mealy. I sent the whole bin back, the whole bin of daughters back. <laughs> the brave thing would have been to keep them, I know, but they seem so impossible to name. The mother nods. She still seems to disapprove, but before I can be certain, her daughters lift her up hungrily and carry her away. The strange thing about being a mother is how often I'm interrupted, like something is happening and then something else is happening. It is difficult to get a good grasp on things. The next day, Miss Birdie is peeling vegetables, 
the babies are watching transfixed. I have come early to pick up my boy, but I don't see my boy. Miss Birdie points to a child the color of chicken broth. Yours? She asks. Definitely not mine, I say. She points to another and another as if I lost my ticket for the coat check. I don't see my boy. It is becoming difficult to breathe and I am suddenly freezing cold. The floor opens up beneath me, and just as I begin to fall through, my boy crawls out from underneath a bassinet. In his fist is a tiny book. On the cover is a picture of a plain brown mouse. He holds it up. Mouse, he says. This is his first real word. My mouse, he says. I am amazed. I am relieved. His pronunciation is perfect. I want to pick him up reward him with kisses, hold him, and never let him go. But Miss Birdie stops me. No, no, she says. She softly wags a finger at my boy. That's not your mouse. That's no one's mouse. Her voice slows. That mouse, Miss Birdie coughs. That mouse, she says, is alone in this world. And barely, Miss Birdie stops. What was that? She asks. What was what? I say. That sound, says Miss Birdie. I don't know, I say. What did it sound like? It was a sound that sounded like a sound, says Miss Birdie, like a sound a sound would make. Never mind. Where was I? You were with the mouse. Oh, the mouse. Do you know him? No, I say, unless you mean, neither do I, says Miss Birdie, and this is my point. That mouse, Miss Birdie is now looking at my boy, that mouse is alone in this world, and barely, Miss Birdie sucks in one long, beautiful breath. Exists, says Miss Birdie triumphantly. That mouse is not unlike you. She's still looking at my boy. When I call for the mouse in the dark, does the mouse come? No, the mouse does not. Do you? So far, not even once. My baby puts his whole hand in Miss Birdie's mouth and leaves it there for what seems like days. On Monday, Miss Birdie's bright pink blouse is fluttering with excitement. Your boy wrote his name today all by himself. She hands me a piece of construction paper. Someone, not my baby, has written on it shreds. I hand the paper back. That is not his name. Oh, says Miss Birdie. She looks at the paper and her face crumples. I am sorry, says Miss Birdie. I don't know how this happened. I don't know how anything happens, I say. We hold hands. I'm so lonely, says Miss Birdie. I'm so lonely too, I say. I thought you were in my hiding place, says Miss Birdie. I picture her skull. I thought you were mine, I say. Miss Birdie ties a yellow scarf around her head. Stop picturing my skull, says Miss Birdie. She is clearly upset. Her lips are cracked <coughs> and begin to bleed a little. She looks at the construction paper and traces each letter with her thumb. If this isn't his name, then whose name is it? She sorts through the other babies. She pats me down as if searching for something. She touches me on the thigh. She feels like she's about to snow. The next day, there's a message from Miss Birdie. We cannot give your boy his bottle. The milk you left was wild. Please bring better milk. I rush to Live Oak. I have no better milk. This is the only milk I have. I point to each breast. Miss Birdie is holding my baby. He is shivering and hungry. Miss Birdie is snowing hard. I try to walk toward her, but there is a great wind, and I can barely see through the big white flakes. This is the only milk I have. I am calling to Miss Birdie and my boy through the snowstorm. My arms are outstretched. Come to mama, I cry. I say my baby's name. 
It sounds smaller and flatter than I ever imagined it. I can't get to him. Miss Birdie is a blizzard that could last all winter. I am sorry. I'm shouting. Miss Birdie has my baby and she is snowing. It is all my fault. I should never have left him. I am sorry. I am sorry. I am sorry. I am punching at the snow. I am fighting against nature when I know I have no choice but to wait until spring. The mother covered in daughters kneels beside me. This time I count 15. Climb on, she says. I'm so sorry, I say. It is the only milk I have. Of course it is, she says. Is there a room, I ask. Around my neck, she says. I climb up and hang on loosely. The mother covered in daughters is warm, and I am so tired. Go to sleep, says the mother. I will wake you up when it's time to go. But the mother never does wake me up, which is how you know the story is true. So do you guys know that um, song, There's a Hole in the Bucket? So I was fascinated by that song as a child. And then there's a, um, a Muppet Show, or a, a Sesame Street version of There's a Hole in the Bucket with these puppets, with these really old, old man and old lady puppets. Have, have any of you seen those? It's really, it's, it's pretty creepy. Um, anyway, so, so I had started thinking about this song um, and reimagined it. So here, here's, there's a hole in the bucket. I look at the bucket. There is unquestionably a hole. An entire family could live in this hole. I see the hole, I yell. Call Mendelssohn. My husband, dear Henry, calls Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn comes right over. We look at the bucket. There is a hole. Mendelssohn studies it. He takes some notes. The southernmost edge of the hole is silent, possibly frozen. The northernmost rough and forgotten. Mendelssohn sniffs it. Smells like gone, he says, just as I thought. Mendelssohn cups his ear, listens to its center, and jots down a slight trace of heart, the bare cry of a faraway boy. With what shall we, asks dear Henry, fix it? The flower in dear Henry's breast pocket is a pink I've never seen before. Lean close, says Mendelssohn. We lean close. This is going to be a nightmare. Dear Henry and I nod our heads. We know already we will need to fetch the water with a bucket to fix the hole, but we will have no bucket to fetch the water to fix the hole because the bucket with which we would fetch the water has a hole. <laughs> a white balloon wafts over dear Henry's head. We are failing miserably. With what, asks dear Henry, shall we fix it? He asks again because even though we know how everything ends, the ending remains unimaginable. With straw, says Mendelssohn hopelessly. With straw, I guess, says Mendelssohn again. I look around for straw. Dear Henry opens a can of sardines. He pulls back the tin lid and offers me one. No thanks, I say. Looking for straw, I say. He offers a sardine to Mendelssohn. Why not, shrugs Mendelssohn. Sardines are caught mainly at night, says dear Henry. I know, says Mendelssohn, chewing soft, slowly on the fish. They are caught when they rise to the surface to feed on plankton, says dear Henry. This is when they're caught, says dear Henry. They're caught at night when they're the hungriest. I know, says M Mendelssohn. Everybody knows, except, I guess, for the sardines, says Dear Henry, Mendelssohn laughs. It's not a joke, says Dear Henry. Sorry, says Mendelssohn. I'm sorry too, says Dear Henry. For what, asks Mendelssohn. 
just for everything, says dear Henry, the bucket and the hole, and just everything. Even though I am certain when I find the straw, the straw will be too long, and I will need to cut the straw with an ax, but the ax will be too dull, and I will need to sharpen the ax with a stone, but the stone will be too dry, and with a hole in the bucket, there is no hope for ever fetching water to wet the stone. I am nevertheless still looking around for straw. This is the song we're in. I hate this bucket. I hate this bucket, I yell. More than the hole, asks dear Henry. He looks so sad. The hole is the hole that the hole should be. It's the bucket that's destroying us, dear Henry. It's the bucket. I look at Mendelssohn. I mean, I really look at him. Every day, he looks more and more like my mother. With what shall we fix it, Mendelssohn? I am exhausted. How many times can a person ask the same question? Mendelssohn kneels gently beside the bucket and reaches all the way in. His dark, soft curls cover his eyes. Liza, says dear Henry, grabbing my arm, I think we're dying. With a stone in his hand, Mendelssohn reaches all the way into the bucket, past the hole, past God and summer and almonds and shame and the ocean and mice and love and fevers and worship and snails and teeth and lilac and forgiveness and a song about a bucket with a hole in it and past all the children singing the song and past their children singing it and their children's children and past my broken heart until he reaches the oldest water and wets the stone. He pulls the stone out and sets it right on top of dear Henry's head as if dear Henry were a tombstone and I've come to his grave to mourn him. The wet stone listen, glistens so brightly I need to cover my eyes. With what, asked dear, dear Henry, shall we? I can barely hear him. The song is fading like a song. It is what it is. I remove the wet stone from the top of dear Henry's head and bury it in my pocket. I notice that the crack shaped like a bucket on dear Henry's cheek is spreading. There's a hole in that bucket too. I look over at Mendelssohn. He is building a whole entire city out of buckets. There are holes in all of these says Mendelssohn, who is now covered in halls, under a sky covered in halls, lit by a moon covered in halls, kept by prayers covered in halls. Off in the distance, I can already see the people coming to live in Mendelssohn's city of holes. There are so many people, and they are so beautiful and hopeful, and they too are covered in halls. They each carry a bucket. And in each bucket is a hole. This is a song. misleading for, for major Vonnegut fans. Um, I wouldn't want to disappoint the Vonnegut fan. And also, I, I'd like to thank um, Brigitte. Thank you so much for inviting me out in the English department. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. It's also, um, there, there, there are times where I think um, um, I'm cheating on poems um, because I started off as a, as a poet and now I'm writing these stories. 
Um, so there's a lot of that in here too. If you love poems so much, says the bully, why don't you marry poems? I have wandered onto a playground accidentally. I am a 67-year-old woman standing on the three of a hopscotch game blurred by last night's rain. It is September. The swings smile their black, rubberish smiles. I smile back politely. What's your name, Bully? Bully puffs out his chest. Beetlebaum, he says. Listen, Beetlebaum, I did marry poems. We've been married for years. There is a space between Beetlebaum's front teeth that reminds me of poems. My cell rings. It's mom. I tell her about the bully. I tell her his name is Beetlebaum and, the, and that the space between his front teeth reminds me of poems. Describe, says mom. Like wild shade, I say. More, says mom. Like an empty Bible, I say. How's that, asks mom. Like if the Bible was a room you could walk inside and there was nothing. No Genesis, no Exodus, no numbers, no God, no light, no darkness. Ma is silent. Beetlebaum coughs. I don't really know, I say. Stick with the shade, says Ma. Beetlebaum's fists are clenched. He jumps and sways around me. He is shouting, if you love poems so much, why don't you marry poems? Beetlebaum is a bad listener. I crouch down and look Beetlebaum straight in the eye. I do not like repeating myself, but this time I do. I must. I did marry for proof, I flash my bands. Beetlebaum squints. And not only did I marry poems, but at the time we married, it was only legal to do so in six states. We married in Iowa, Beetlebaum, Iowa. Have you ever believed, Beetlebaum, in something much, much bigger than you? Beetlebaum is sweating. Liar, shouts Beetlebaum. Listen, Beetlebaum, it's a bad economy. You're trying to spend me when I've already been spent. I sit him on a bench and tie his shoelaces. Some would say we're in a depression, Beetlebaum. Over the years, I applied for dozens and dozens of jobs. I killed many interviews, slaughtered them, in fact. I held those who may be concerned to my bosom and answered their questions so expertly, I left them weeping, weeping into my skin, Beetlebaum. Was I sloppy at times? Perhaps. Was my perfume magnificent? It was. Was I overly prepared? Never. Did they call me back, Beetlebaum? No, they did not. No one was really hiring. And if they were hiring, they weren't paying. And if they were paying, they were only paying Donald. Do you know Donald, Beetlebaum? Beetlebaum shakes his head no. Do you know why you don't know Donald? You don't know Donald because nobody knows Donald. Donald doesn't exist. Donald is the man none of us will ever be. I peel Beetlebaum a hard-boiled egg and offer it to him. He turns his face away. I took courses on miracles, Beetlebaum. Honest to God miracles. And where did that leave me? Where did that leave me, Beetlebaum? I am asking you, Beetlebaum. Beetlebaum looks at me and blinks. Where did taking courses on miracles leave me? It left you on the playground with me. That's right, Beetlebaum. It left me on the playground with you. Ma calls. Do you need milk? She is shouting. She thinks I am always in need of milk. Not now, Ma, I say. I am getting somewhere. The job market is an empty mouse. You know what that means, Beetlebaum? Beetlebaum sh shakes his head no. It means no blood, no bones, not even a liver, Beetlebaum, not even a couple of guts. It means just a sad pile of fur you couldn't, no matter how hard you tried, ever turn into a coat. Not even a lousy scarf, Beetlebaum. Nothing holds it together, Beetlebaum. Nothing holds it together. Beetlebaum looks like he's about to cry. I must his hair as Ma once must mine. Up and down the seesaw we go. Have you ever put on a suit, Beetlebaum? Have you ever showed up exactly on time with hope in your heart? Have you ever been the most qualified candidate by far? Beetlebaum looks down at his skinny hands, 
Beetle Gum tries to run away, but I catch him by the collar. Poems is looking for me. Sometimes I get lost, like today. Ma calls. She tells me she is reading Slaughterhouse Five. It says here, says Ma, everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. She says this to reassure me, as if she's reading the newspaper and not a drawing of a gravestone in a book. Ma's sharp, but lousy with fiction. Beetlebound holds my hand. We watch the toes hop across the damp ground. They know something we don't know, says Beetlebound, and they do. The toads do. Just when I begin to wonder if Beetlebound is a real child, poem shows up. Beautiful poems, the color of upturned soil. Poems walk straight up to Beetlebound. There's, there's a new sheriff in town, he says, but poems doesn't say this like a sheriff. He doesn't say this like he's protecting me. He says this like he's missing in a whisper. He feels for the badge on his chest, but there is no badge. Maybe it dropped, says Beetlebound. They are on their hands and knees. They are looking for the badge so poems can show Beetlebound he's the new sheriff in town. They crawl under the monkey bars. It's gold and star-shaped, says poems. I know, says Beetlebound. Everybody knows that, says Beetlebound. Even babies, even, Beetlebound says, pointing at me, her. Then he picks up a rock and throws it at my head. There is blood. If you love poems so much, why don't you marry poems? Poems looks distraught. Do the thing, says Beetlebound, where you cry. And poems cries. Poems cry so hard a cloud bursts and children spill out. They fall through the air. Their legs and arms go in every direction like sunshine. They land softly. They flood the play playground in brightly colored pajamas. They are carrying books keys, bones, the bareness of my being. Some are carrying each other. They march up to Beetlebound and surround him. Of all the children, Beetlebound seems the most elderly. Pale Beetlebound in his fake corduroy shorts. Ma calls. There's no such thing as fake corduroy, says Ma. Only corduroy regular. It's like skin, says Ma. It's either skin or if it's fake, it's something else. Now Beetlebound is in the middle of a thick circle of children who have fallen from the clouds. They do not taunt him or throw bones. They just stare and hum and ask Beetlebound who he loves. Who do you love, Beetlebound? Ma calls. It's impolite to love no one, she says, and Ma would know. I tell Ma my head is bleeding. Of course it is, says Ma. Poems is on the swings crying and crying. Clouds are bursting with more and more children. Beetlebound, Beetlebound, who do you love? The children are singing, the children are swaying. And then Beetlebound's voice, muffled by all the children, but I know it's Beetlebound in there. Beetlebound, Beetlebound, who do you love? I hear it, and just when I hear it, just when I hear Beetlebound say my name, Poems is beside me. Poems has collected some leaves to wipe the blood from my head. I tell Poems it's me. I tell Poems Beetlebound loves me. But then I hear Beetlebound say Poland. Then I, see, then I hear Beetlebound say fish. Then Beetlebound says nose. Poems is wiping away all the blood. I close my eyes. I tell Poems Beetlebound said my name. Poems says shh. Ma is calling. I hear Beetlebound say forgive. There is so much blood. This is how poem saves me. Thank you. So, oh, thank you very much. Um, so we do have the opportunity, I mean students and a few colleagues, have the opportunity to ask you questions and we can have maybe a discussion. So feel free to ask anything. Don't be shy. Yes. Does a mouse appear in every story? Um, almost every story. Oh, that is the significance of that. That's or, really. Or do I have to read it to find out? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've always um, 
shy about you know um, fastening an image to any one um, you know piece of significance. Like I grab, I I like. Um, um, one way that I, I really like to use images is to see, um, you know, like how far they can go, like how how much inf how um, um, powerfully they can inform stories, but in different ways. Um, so, like the way that a mouse, um, what what a mouse might mean to one story, um, may be something totally different um, in another story. Um, but it does kind of like scamper through, for lack of a, a better word. But yeah, yeah. Um, I, I also like love the word. I mean, a lot often, um, and this is I think coming at stories as a as a poet first. Like if I mean, you know, I, I have a story here um, uh, um, where snails appear, and it's really I, I just. I love the word snails first, and then I go and, and, and research snails, um, as opposed to sort of like loving like the, the actual snail mm -hmm. first, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, mice are in lots of fairy tales. Yes, and right, the yes. Good night mouse and good night house is what I thought at one point. Yes, yeah. 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 Just the sound of the words. Yeah, I mean, right, and I think that's part of it. I think part of one of the reasons why I think like there are um, you know, um, um, certain figures that appear um, in fairy tales, you know, like the mouse. Um, part of it, I think, is is the actual word, um, and and part of it is also that like the figure of the mouse is a kind of um, there's something very. Um, uh, basic about that animal, right? Like, as opposed to, you know, having a unicorn in every story. Like, I wanted it very grounded in the way that, like, the mouse is very grounded. Mm -hmm. yeah. And domestic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, my was kind of long for you guys are going to you say that uh, you did research, you would do research on, like, a snail. So, like, you do research, a lot of research for this, because I know, and one where you were talking about the sardines and like the right. job you do for you know, so do you do a lot of research for them? Yes, and it's and it's um it's language driven as opposed to like plot driven. So like I'll get into this, you know, I'll get into an image and I'll start thinking, I need to know more about this. I need there was there was one point um where I have seahorses in another story, um and I started thinking about like actually, I became so obsessed with seahorses that I started thinking about like actually getting a pet seahorse. <laughs> and I looked into getting a pet seahorse. And I have a dog and a cat and, and two little boys. The last thing I need is a pet seahorse. <laughs> but um, I don't get a pet seahorse. You can never, you'll never be able to go on vacation again. Um, it's incredibly difficult. Um, they're, um, they're probably like more high maintenance than having a dog or a cat. It was fascinating. And I think that like there was something about like some kind of strange attachment that if you do go away, they they know. They'll like get sick and they know. You know, if you if you um, keep them in an aquarium and, yeah, just have, you know, like a neighbor come and feed them. Yeah. <laughs> Or get a pet seahorse and then let me know about it. <laughs> yeah. So, how would you describe your writing process? So, it's really changed over the years. Um, before I had children, I would write in these um, massive blocks. Um, you know, like I would write for 12 hours, 14 hours just straight, 16 hours straight, um, which is part of, I think, why my form has changed. After I had children, I couldn't do that anymore. Uh, I mean, I, I could, but then my kids wouldn't have eaten it. <laughs> um, that would have been bad. 
so I, I, what I started doing was, um, I, you know, I would write for two hours, one hour, I would write in the car, I would write, you know, like I would just kind of grab different flashes of time to write. And so what was happening where was when, um, when I started off writing poetry and writing these prose poems, I could write, you know, one prose poem in a in a like in a 16-hour kind of um, um, very focused um, uh, kind of hermetically sealed space of time, um, and and I mean they wouldn't always come in the 16 hours. Sometimes nothing would come, but um, but usually if I finished if I if I had something I pretty much started it and finished it in the same sitting. Um, so what happened when I started being able to only write in like an hour here, two hours there, is that I kept coming back to it, coming back to it and adding and adding and adding. So that the prose poem, which you know is kind of the shape like a box, it, I mean this is, this is um, why I think it started becoming kind of like unwieldy, where I would add to it and it would get longer and, and um, you know, more of the world started coming in. Also, I think like before I had kids, I, I was able to get away with being very um, not participating a lot with like with the outside world. Um, but now, you know, I have to talk to people. <laughs> so um, I think that there were like these tears in my writing where like I was al al allowing the outside world to come in. Um, um, and interrupt, um, and so suddenly there was like a break in a line, you know, and then that was a paragraph, and then there was another break in a line. So, so now it really is, um, you know, now I write whenever I can, um, but I don't really have those like long stretches of time. I do really try to write every single day, though, um, because once you fall away from it, it's really hard to get back inside, and then you spend all this time trying to get back inside, and then you fall away from it again, and then you, um, so, so I've been trying really hard to at least write like an hour, at least an hour a day. So what do you do now? Um, so I can't think of anything to write. Oh boy, I cry. <laughs> <laughs> right now I'm writing a, a monthly column for the Paris Review on motherhood and fairy tales. So I'm on like really strict deadlines and that's been really good because I write, I mean there's just terror, terror of not meeting deadlines. So that is a really great, fear is a great incentive. Right? <laughs> um, and I like deadlines um, and I, I used to feel very much like I would write something and then I would need this like incubation period, you know, like I would need a way to sort of like plug back in and recharge and um, and now I don't have the time to do that. Like I have to go from like one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. And um, I think that, you know, the writing for me, the more I write, the more ideas I have. Um, so, which is why I really do try to do the, the one hour a day at least, and, and it does the consistent writing and the consistent like sitting at the desk and just being present even if nothing's coming, I think um, helps keep things coming. Um, the writer Amos Oz, the Israeli writer Amos Oz, talked about um, his, his role model for, for writings, his father who had owned a grocery store and every morning he would go into the grocery store and sweep the floors and you know put the open sign on and uh, turn the open sign around and, and he would wait. And sometimes customers would come and sometimes nobody would come. You know, and it's the same thing with writing. It's like you sit, you're at the desk and you're working um, and sometimes no customers show up, you know, but maybe tomorrow. So. But you have to keep the door open. Um, and I also feel that there are ideas out there, like that 
there are these sorts of there are these images and ideas out there, and if you're open to it and you're tuned in and you're thinking, um, you can get one. But if you're not, someone else will get it. So um, there's that. Yeah. Um, the the any of these um, stories come from personal experience, so they are just fiction. Are they just fiction or they small them came from personal experience? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that um, these stories were, for me, I feel much more exposed in fiction than I do in poetry. Um, I feel like a lot more of like my real life, even though these are, you know, um, there there's a lot of surrealism in these these stories, and there are these, a lot of like there's a lot of fairy tale and like the fantastical and the unbelievable happening in a lot of the stories. Um, they're very very deeply informed by you know um, um, my actual day. Um, I'll give you an example. So um, I go to a lot of children's birthday parties because um, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, and there's just a lot of birthday parties all the time. And we went to one birthday party, and um, the kids sat around in a circle, and they played this game, Pass the Parcel. I don't know if you know it, but like basically you take a little toy, and you wrap it, and wrap it, and wrap it, like you know, let's say 50 times, and um, the kids all sit around in a circle, and they pass this little parcel, and each time the music stops, they unwrap one layer, and then and then they pass it again, and they unwrap another layer, and then um, the 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 um, uh, the kid where the music stops the final time, you know, gets the prize. Um, and so I was sitting there, and I was watching them all like, pass. Um, this little gift around, and of course, like it ends up ending on the birthday boys. You know, like the birthday boy is always the one who gets the the last layer. But I'm I'm watching them go around, and I thought I start thinking like, imagine if it never ends. Like, imagine if we just like stand here forever, and like the parents get older, and the children get older, and like everything gets dusty like all over the house and um, you know and they just keep but but it's a game and, and that's the rule and you have to keep passing it until like you remove layers and layers and layers so I mean I do like sometimes I'm usually when I'm bored like my imagination will just start going wild um, so that would be like an example of like I would, you know, I did think about like starting a story there, you know, just like at a kid's birthday party, and then like, and then like, where's the break? Like, where's the place where if just one thing shifted, um, we would be in this like entirely other set of circumstances? And I do try to stay, um, unlike my first two collections, where the setting was very much in like, was very much like otherworldly. I try to stay like very much like in the living room, like in these very domestic settings, um, and then just try to see like what impossible thing can happen inside of that space. Yeah. Yes. Um, when you were finalizing your stories, were there any stories that didn't make the cut? Yeah. And it's so healthy. Just one. Um, I fought for, uh, originally it was going to be two, but I, I, uh, I fought for, um, for both of them to get returned. Um, and I think with thinking about a collection, um, and um, my editor felt as though there was one, one story in particular that was doing a lot of the same things that other stories were doing but not as well, and so it was sort of like robbing the other stories of what they were doing well. So that, I, and I, I saw, I got it, like I, uh, but it was, the book was very lightly edited. It wasn't, um, and as a poet, you know, um, my first two collections, they were barely, I mean, it, um, 
It's not often, I think, with poetry collections that they're very heavily edited. I mean, every once in a while, yes, very much so, but, um, and now I'm working with an editor at the Parents Review um, pretty intensely, and um, I actually really enjoy being edited, um, if you find the right editor. Um, uh, the woman I'm working with, her name's Nadja Spiegelman, she has a memoir, and um, I, I feel like we, um, uh, we're up the same alley, you know, so, so um, it's really, it's, it's just, it's a gift to have a good editor. Um, and this is really, um, you know, with this collection and, um, and then the Paris Review column is the first time that, yeah. Whereas I used to think, like, don't touch that. You know, like, everything was so precious. Um, no, like, how could you say that? This is the best line. But I, I've gotten better about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking, is it because I care less? But <laughs>